good and specified time period if the calendar's still functioning by the time you hear this podcast. My name is Richard. And my name is Carl. And welcome. And this oh. is uh, Deep Space and Dragons. On today's topic, mm-hmm. we're going to go into the bit of the deep space of the matter and talk about how I peer pressured Carl into 70 years of classic animation. But first, what's new in the world of Carl? Uh, well, I've been uh, been doing some work out of town, and I uh, ran into a buddy. Uh, you know, uh, went for coffee with him, and uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, he started telling me about how uh, how things have been going, and uh, apparently uh, he was uh, had some struggles with mental health and addiction, um, and uh, he ended up uh, getting clean, and he's been clean for a year now. And I just thought that was. Uh, it was pretty exciting because you know now he has like a, a kid on the way and stuff. It's like it's just like to share in people's success like that, you know. That's actually really good to hear. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, compared to the "What's New with Me" segment, which of course I have to by <laughs> podcast law wait for you to ask me, or else I'm being pretentious. Uh, yeah, what is new with Richard? So I managed to successfully have a chain of hiccups last to triple digits yesterday. Over a hundred hiccups? Yeah. Every single hiccup, Cassie counted. And then laughed a bit, because my hiccups are so violent, I pretty much bounce out of the chair. (laughs) How long did it take you to hiccup a hundred times? Um, between two till about seven. Wow. And I mean, of course everyone has their solutions. And... Of course, it's like, well, you need to eat peanut butter. I'm like, two people will die from the smell of peanut butter at this barbecue. I think I'll just keep hiccuping. Well, someone needs to scare you. <laughs> Joke's on you. I'm fearless unless there's either dogs, bees, needles, roller coasters, an in-depth discussion of biology, um, particularly angry geese. If none of those are present, I'm fearless. So... Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I guess, uh, I was going to say, I'm a little confused about the roller coaster thing, but but the roller coaster that went backwards did almost kill you. That that was spooky, man. Like, the older <laughs> I get, the more, like, solidified my fear of heights get. And there was an incident where me and Cassie were on a Ferris wheel. You will recall, because we had pawned off my mother's foster kid on you to be entertained while I went on this Ferris wheel. Mm-hmm. And I nearly had a panic attack. Oh, dear. Yeah, because it turns out I have a fear of heights, but if we go fast, gotta go fast. I only get spooked when we're going the clickety-clack up the roller coaster. Once I'm already (laughs) falling to my doom, my brain knows there's no solution to this problem and doesn't care anymore. But Well, I mean, they they do say that the the difference between fear and enjoyment is is actually a, a mental choice, almost. No. There's no version of reality where the rickety Saskatoon Ferris wheel, where the entire thing's moving from the wind back and forth. Well, the North <clears throat> Battleford Ferris wheel will bring any comfort I, I was going to gonna say, it, it was definitely a smaller town than Saskatoon. <laughs> so. <laughs> Which, I mean, that just probably doesn't speak to the quality of the rides. It's just, you know, smaller town. <laughs> Fair enough. But I feel the need to tell this story because now the what's new with both of us section is remember that time we went in a bouncy castle with giant inflatable fists and you beat the hell out of me? I just felt the need uh, that all of our listeners needed to hear that story. I, yeah, I think they said that those were like five five pound gloves or something. I'm really like ten pound gloves. They're real heavy. I mean, it was a fully worthwhile endeavor, but I do not have the coordination to bouncy castle and punch at the same time. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I just assumed it was your well, well earned vengeance for that time that I made your thumb go all purple in a duel. Uh, yeah, wooden swords, not nice. But to pivot from that nostalgia to today's topic of Mobile Suit Gundam. So I have to ask did you get to Gundam before I started chucking it at you in DVD form? Um. <clears throat> No, I don't think so. Because yeah. in my case, and... well, I don't. Maybe, oh. maybe actually, uh, I might have, like, uh, I would watch Gundam Seed on on YTV, uh, and then I might have mentioned that to you, and then you're like, oh, he likes Gundam, and then then it spiraled out of control from there. But... I mean, so you did end up with my brother at the Gundam Cafe on the family vacation I did not go on. 
<laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like, I need to stay and make sure my cat in her house survives, because if all of us go at once, we'll come back and be homeless somehow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, me and Panda did, did travel to, uh, to Japan and uh, ate at the Gundam Cafe. Like, I'm actually wearing my Gundam Cafe t-shirt right now, at this exact moment. <laughs> Which, oh, that brings me to a story from this, uh, yesterday. So we were playing a trivia game, and mm -hmm. trivia game loosely, it was called Six Second Rule, I believe, and how it worked is you got asked a question, you had to name three objects that met the criteria, like gemstones or Beatles members or whatever. But if you mm -hmm. couldn't answer all three, the next person gets to try, but they can't use any names that were already mentioned. Okay. So we got to a question of civil rights leader, and everyone could get to two. So by the time it got to me, we had no Malcolm X, we had no Abraham Lincoln, we had pretty much no one. So I yelled out okay. Char Asnable, Miliardo Peacecraft, <laughs> and Mari Mea Cruz Renata. One person at this group clapped. Everyone else stared at me for a moment, being like, I've never heard of any of them. So... <laughs> <laughs> to get people up to speed here, Char Aznable is famously the villain from the original Gundam, the protagonist of the second Gundam, vanished in the third one, was the main villain of the fourth movie, got cloned in the fifth movie, got cloned again in the sixth movie, was maybe a ghost at one point, and is the reason for the masked villain trope. So... I... I I, I was going to ask you how many Char lookalikes there are throughout all of Gundam. Uh, I think all of them by Gundam law have to have at least one. <laughs> and yeah, okay. then any anime that tried to be Gundam put in one. I'm going to do a quick right. Google search and see number of Char clones. And see if we can get a... Well, it's a trope on TVTropes.org, which is always a good sign for popularity. Right, right. So, one, two, three. Apparently, there's over 50 entries of different shows with shark clones. It's so over 50 wow. different shows, not even counting Gundam. Uh, that, that have a masked villain. Well, to be a shark, you have to meet three tropes. You have to be a masked villain. Mm -hmm. You have to be in some way, shape, or form related to the main care, the main factions of the war you're in, and there has to be a oh. war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because if the mask isn't for a political reason and there isn't a war, then you're not a shark. Makes sense. And he's often uh, the big so, brother to a character. Uh, so who was the who was the second Gundam character on your list? So it was Char, first it was Char, second was Miliardo Peacecraft, who was another Char. He was Zex Marquis in Gundam Wing. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. And then the third one wasn't a masked villain. It was Mari Mea Cruz Renata, the second oh. villain in the Gundam Wing movie. <laughs> <laughs> And the argument I tried to okay. give, they didn't give me the point in the trivia game, but I'm like, okay, Char very clearly was a leader for Space Noid Independence. He had a song, mm -hmm. he had flags, he had banners. He was, by definition, a civil rights leader. Yeah, yeah. He also Noid. blew up, dropped a space colony, and plunged the Earth into nuclear winter, winter for freedom. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yep, for freedom specifically. Mm hmm so I'm just so they didn't give me the point because it turns out they have to be real civil rights leaders. I'm like that's some bullshit. They're like, well maybe you didn't pick three Gundam ones. I'm like, how many animes tackle the topic of civil rights in general? Because anim Gundam has always used the allegory of space colonies versus Earth as a way to be like a blanket comparison to any real world civil issue. Because most often it's the space colonies are oppressed by the evil Earth Federation, which you can just see the air quotes that say British Empire on them. And yet, for most of the series, we watch the Earth Federation side. They usually do a trilogy, though. So it starts like, you're the Earth Federation, and you're the good guys because you got bombed or attacked by terrorists. Then they do the second mm -hmm. movie with the big twist that the Earth Federation won, but is going corrupt and evil, and now they're compressing everybody. And then they have a mm. third one where they typically break down all regional borders and humanity lives as one in space. <laughs> just kidding. They just redo those two main plot points over and over again until they run out of screen time. Uh, yeah, that, that makes sense. But, um, oh, go ahead. 
Well, so, um, you, uh, speaking of terrorists, you, you had asked me to watch, uh, Gundam Hathaway on Netflix. Uh, and Gundam Hathaway is, is basically about a, uh, former Earth Federation soldier, uh, who begins to sympathize with, with the, uh, space noids and, and, uh, grapples with the idea of becoming a, a terrorist because you know being a terrorist kind of takes over your entire identity there it... um oh. and, and then i uh I, I went on a bit of a of a of rabbit trail <laughs> uh because the hathaway movie so so there's original gundam uh then there's zeta gundam then there's double Zeta Gundam. You can skip and double Zeta there's... Gundam. Okay, and well, and then there's okay. So what was between double Zeta and Shard's counterattack then? Nothing. Oh, yeah. Okay, so there's those are the four four main series, right? Oh yeah, those would definitely be the core. Also, they did an eighth oh. MS team series somewhere in there, where they're like, let's do a regular soldier instead of a teenager of superpowers. And I can monologue oh. about that one for a while. But Gundam is one of those series where you watch the main characters and their shiny stuff, and the fans typically care far more about the side characters, like the beautiful Zaku, rather than the pretty Gundams that make up the center stage. But please continue. Okay, but but so uh, a lot of animes, and including Gundam, have uh, released uh, movie compilations of, of the seasons, uh, which I really enjoy the condensed movie compilations. A lot of the times, uh, they can they can cut out a significant amount of, of fluff. It's kind of funny because um, just to times out, me and a friend of mine went through Ruby, uh, a Rooster Teeth anime CGI series, and they gave compilation movies for the first four seasons. And then, in order to mm -hmm. trick our friends into watching it, we compilation movied the other eight ourselves, so we could okay, hand the movies out okay. to people so they could watch them in one sitting. Just that tangent needed to go in. I'm pretty sure I'm obligated by that friend to mention Ruby's great once in a while, but let's continue. Uh, but so I was like, okay, well, like, uh, what order did all these series happen in? And then it's like, okay, they got compilation movies. I was like, I wonder if I could like watch any of these compilation, how many compilation movies I could watch. So then I found an article that said that Gundam.info had posted some movies on their YouTube website, or YouTube channel, I mean. <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> um, but it was an old article, so when I went and checked out their website, uh, they did not have uh, the, any movies on there. <laughs> but uh, they did have posted the, entire, the entirety of, well, Iron-Blooded Orphans it's on YouTube. You can watch for free. Uh, not part of the main Gundam timeline, but it's an interesting. Yeah, that show, show. gives me thoughts—thoughts thoughts that could probably do their entire episode because they took some. Sh I'm not gonna say risky, like you know, like sometimes people take a risky stance, and you're like, "Oh, you're so brave! How can you say so something controversial?" But Iron Blood mm -hmm. Orphans took some weird stances, not like risky, just weird, and I was not expecting anyone to take this stance. And it's not a bad stance or a good stance, it's just a stance I didn't see coming. To give light spoilers to the show, there is a lengthy debate I've had on whether it was pro-polygamy or pro-free choice. But moving back from Iron Blood Orphans to this Hathaway movie, also, the original three Gundam compilation movies are just on Netflix right now as well. Uh, well, the rabbit hole... Then, like on on the website, uh, you know the the BB Senshi uh, like Romance of the Three Kingdoms Dynasty Warriors uh, yes. Gundam series, right? Because <laughs> of course that exists. Because Gundam's not just a show; it's a lifestyle at this point. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just Gundams uh, decked out in like traditional Chinese armor with like Chinese names and stuff. But <clears throat> I thought I saw that on there on the on the Gundam Info site. I was like, oh, maybe I'll watch this and see what it's all about. Because, I mean, they're just adorable little chibi Gundams with, like, facial features. And it's, <laughs> it's pretty adorable. Uh, <clears throat> turns out uh, that that wasn't the original BB Senshi. Uh, <laughs> and in the first episode, they mentioned that there's a virus that kills Gundams. And then... Uh, 
they're searching for someone who can who can make a vaccine for this virus. Too real. And uh, between trying to identify uh, which Gundams I could remember the names of under their Shane Crancy Chinese armor, and uh, the comparing it to the events of 2020, <laughs> I was like, huh, vaccine, vaccine virus. I, I I had to watch the whole thing. That's fascinating. It was like two and a. It was like two and a half hours. You see, I love when I get you in the weirdest deep dives. So, I'm like basic Gundam stuff, and I'm like, hey, check out this awesome PS2 Gundam game where I never went through the original Gundam and Zeta Gundam when I was a kid because they're older than me. But I do remember Gundam Wing being amazing. It had mm. one of the best trailers of all time where a person gives a speech, they drop them out of a plane. While they're falling out the plane, they shoot them through the heart midair. That is just oh. one of my favorite scenes in anything. They turn yeah, around okay. coldly, say your usefulness is done, drop the bottom of the plane, have them drop into a random chunk of jungle, turn around, shoot them through the head as they're falling. I'm like, that's that's so extra. I, I might be in love with this. <laughs> but tragically, I never finished the original run of Gundam Wing on YTV because I was 10? And mm. time zones, because they don't quite match Alberta and... YTV's broadcasting, it got pushed past my bedtime due to a time zone shift. Ooh, bummer. Yeah, so I did go back in Gundam Wing. Gundam Wing Endless Waltz is by far my favorite Christmas movie of all time. <laughs> but what's funny is I remember me and you went through, not Gundam Seed, but Gundam Seed Abridged, where nerdy voice actors online dubbed it over. And at some chain of events, that led to you discovering what might be my favorite video game of all time. Oh? Yeah, our SD Gundam game, which I'll let you give the description of that one, because that is the one Gundam game you own that I cannot beat you at consistently. <laughs> the SD Gundam Gashapon Wars? Yep. So, I mean, uh, the the Gashapon machines are like, you know, capsule machines that you just, like, put in money and it pops out a capsule. Uh, and then the Gundam Wars is basically, you know, if you... Turn the capsule machine, you get a little Gundam, and then you can put it into your army and play uh, a grid-based uh, strategy game. <clears throat> Which is interesting, because it has a few mechanics that I, that I haven't seen in any other grid-based strategy games. Uh, I.e., uh, like, you can... It basically uses the mechanics for your... Go, in a way. Well, not Go, reverse right. Well, I mean, there was the, the territory capture, where if you had a line between two units, you could capture all the territory between them. And if you formed a square between four units, you could capture all the territory within there. And uh, once you capture enough territory, uh, the enemy has one turn to try and recapture territory, or else you win. Uh, and then uh, that had this, like, unit-shoving mechanic. Uh, where I you will always like... remember where I under I lowballed the unit shoving mechanic where you can move into an enemy an ally square to move an ally, until you beat me one match with an elaborate series of fighter jets designed just to shove people strategically to capture my base <laughs> without firing a single bullet. I'm like, did you just zuge on me? Like, <laughs> what is this? When did you read the Art of War between my eight in the morning shift and when I got home? Oh. <laughs> uh... Uh, but that is that is definitely uh, one of my favorite games. I, I actually uh, imported uh, the well, I imported the GameCube version and the Wii version. Although I don't don't know what happened to my GameCube version. I have it. But the Wii version was just just a yeah, slightly straight better up. Version you just anyways. gave me the GameCube version, so I'd have a copy, and I have it <laughs> like accessible. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'll take the other version of this to practice because you beat me and this is unacceptable. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, so when I was in Saskatchewan, me and my brother also <laughs> imported a Japanese PS2 to get more video games because we didn't have internet. Not really. We had internet, but it would load a video at one second per minute. So it'd be like we'd uh, set an episode yeah. of Naruto to buff it, buffer, and then we'd have a day before we could watch it. <laughs> Which this had happened, and it was deeply tragic. So we can't read Japanese, but we had fully functional Japanese Gundam games to play through. Like, there's one crossover game called Ace, Another Century's Episode, and they just pulled giant robots from random animes I hadn't seen, 
and there's no dialogue, and after thumbing my way through this, I did like a horrifying binge watch of all the animes that made this anime crossover game. And I've seen so many shars. So many shars. Like my one of my favorite shows, Code Geass, just like what if Shar but protagonist? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, why don't we just take the normal character who's anti-Shar and kind of make him an antagonist and let Shar be the protagonist in all his corrupt glory. He needs a mask, he needs an edgy backstory. I'm like, this is great. So, on the topic of Gundam games, for a while, we used to play a free computer game, Gundam Capsule Fighter, which was... A oh yeah, SD Gundam Online. Oh, oh man. It's one of those things where, if they were just a little less greedy, their game would have survived. Because people love the get a Gundam out of a vending machine and play an FPS with it. First person shooter. It was good times, but then they literally had events like the person who spent the most money in their cash shop got a free suit. <laughs> like, that, that might be the least shameless gold digging I've ever seen a video game. Hey, this person, congratulations, you spent the most money, have a free Gundam. Uh, well, I mean, they did have uh, like lower like tiers where it's like... Every you spent X amount of money got something, but but yeah, it was pretty pretty shameless in their, their cash grab, which I mean, just kind of too bad because we played like the, the Taiwanese version because that was the first version we had access to, and then then they released it in English, and it was like yeah, but it just didn't last that long. It's kind of crazy how much I was able to bring you along my Gundam journey, where you had watched one show to your admission. Had a couple page pages of manga you picked up from a comic book shop once upon a time, and I somehow had you figuring out how VPN was worked at 15, 16 to try and import this video game for this franchise you kind of liked. Because you're in for the trip now, I had you. <laughs> <laughs> and this ends well, with like you. I said, the, um, the, the SD Gundam World Sengoku Soketsuden. It's supposed to be a, a reboot of, of the BB Senshi Dynasty Warriors series, although n not really at all in the original spirit of, of the show, since it's not Dynasty Warriors or Romance of the Three Kingdoms anymore. Uh, but they're all SD Gundams, so it's like I, I, a lot of them I recognize as like, oh, what's the name of that one, that one, that one? And kind then of like at the, the end, Psycho I Dice? Credits, and I was like, there was like New Gundam, there was Tall Geese 2 and 3, uh, the the main villain was Destiny. That's hilarious. Destiny Gundam. So to pivot into Gunpla, we can't talk about Gundam without Gundam, Gundam model kits, or more important, <laughs> virtual Gundam model kits in a Gundam model kit video game. So <laughs> late into the PlayStation 3's life cycle, they released Gundam Breaker 1, 2, and 3. And the premise was, you know what? Sure, we have this giant dramatic space opera with dramatic twists and turns that experiences human nature and the very evolution of mankind to the stars. But what people really want is the ability to paint 3D model kits. They were not wrong. They were not wrong. Because it's like... I, mean, I, I, I never played Gundam Breaker 2, but Gundam Breaker 1 and Gundam Breaker 3, just so much customization at different parts. Like, it, it became so awesome. an interesting thing because we'd play these co-op missions together because we are looking for specific parts. Not because we wanted to be the strongest or the fastest, but me and Carl would each come up with a vision of what it is we wanted to build. And getting the parts to build that, and building them, we probably spent more time customizing our units than playing the game. And it was delightful. <laughs> like... Yeah. <clears throat> then you just have like six different sweet, like multi-part models all together. That you paint them to get a cohesive theme. Like, oh, I was so... Like, one of my favorite ones I built is... It was before the Dice to Warriors SD Gundam came out, so they totally stole my idea. But I took the parts from, like, the Samurai Gundam and made, like, a really cool, like, patterned <laughs> Sasanui armor sword mech. And I'm just like, this looks crazy. I am happy with myself. And you're like, cool, I have a mech that deploys as many self-shooting guns as possible. My strategy is I push fire, and then I cackle as all these little drones fly off me and destroy my enemy. Uh, yeah, the, the Too Many Funnels Gundam was, was super effective. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, shout out to, like, Gundam Breaker, except not New Gundam Breaker, where they ruined everything, and I'm just... No shout out to New Gundam Breaker. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, by not shouting out to it, you just shout it out to it. Yeah, but I hope what happens is that 
they'll see new Gundam Breaker on Steam, realize it has a one-star review, and then go back and get Gundam Breaker 3 and have a great time. <laughs> also, if somebody listening would like to start like a change.org petition to get SD Gundam Gachapon Wars re-released in Nintendo Switch, I'd sign that in a heartbeat, just saying. And if anyone from Nintendo or Gundam is just listening to this, we would love a re-release of that game. <laughs> that we would. <laughs> not a sponsor, just such a fan that we played a game we could not read. That was a strategy game with combat elements. Oh, man. Oh, so yeah, because the when you go into combat, it was actually like a real-time... You're in a little arena, but it was actually like real-time combat in the SD Gundam Gachapon Wars. And then they, like, and added so if... a full survival mode, and, ver like, they had, like, so many modes. But it's like, if, if you were a better pilot, you could actually win battles that you weren't supposed to win. Which I could do until you realize that you're just going to, like, I'd win a one most one-on-one -on -one battles versus my co-host here. Me and Carl would duke it out, and I, this may sound arrogant, was the better Gundam pilot. But it didn't matter if he captured my capital while I was distracted being an ace pilot on the field. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and then it's, like, also having, like, snipers just, like, standing back, and then you get too close, like... It's like... by the time you go into battle, it doesn't matter how good you are, because you're almost dead. And then to put humility to things, there was one of those, like, wave survival modes, which wasn't the grid-based strategy, it was just straight-up good old-fashioned horde mode. Fight. And we needed my brother Panda to just roll up and help us win, because at Gundam games, he's unnaturally good. The technical <laughs> term is a new type. <laughs> Or a coordinator. Yeah, depending on your franchise. Or a coordinator and a new type, because they were pretty vague about that with Mula Flaga. Because <laughs> uh, my favorite Jeremy Gundam moment is we were playing this Gundam Seed game for our Japanese import PS2. And one of the mechs has an attack where it grapples you and self-destructs. He got grappled, the self-destruct started at the exact perfect time, like a frame-perfect dodge. He put up his shield and did a backflip, kicked off and shot him like... The game is... I'm surprised this program to let you do that. What is this? <laughs> I grappled you and self-destructed and you lived. It's not okay. <laughs> uh, or when we were running around in SD Gundam Online, you're like, I got a mace. I'm like, you know there's guns, right? You're like, I got a mace. I'm like, okay, I have a gun. Let's do this. Gundam? Gundam Hammer was my favorite. <laughs> it's just Gundam Hammer or Gundam Age, which also had the hammer, but then has the cool mustache. Oh, it was A-Turn is what you were thinking of. <laughs> my Gundam Encyclopedia oh, yeah, yeah. Acknowledge is definitely my most attractive feature. <laughs> uh, but, like, I'd be remiss to not talk about the actual model kits, because Gundam was the only reason it caught on is so iconic. It has giant multiple life-size statues. Is people are all about those model kits. Well, uh, Gundam uh, is, in Japan, like what Transformers was in North America. Uh, like, Gundam was made to sell model kits and toys. It was kind of funny, because uh, the toys didn't catch on, and Gundam itself, people know it didn't want to buy Gundam. It was red, white, and blue, and fun kid colors. They wanted Zaku, which was grimy, weird-looking, mono-eyed, had a hatchet. But I mean, like, <clears throat> you, you can even see the, the the evolution from the original Gundam was, was gritty and, and uh, like... Some of the they were more like trying to be somewhat realistic, uh, but then uh, Zeta Gundam and Double Zeta. It's like if your mobile suit didn't transform, you were doing something wrong. Uh, <laughs> transforming mobile suits are definitely like that's so cool. Let's buy those toys and model kits and stuff. Well, it's kind of crazy as you watch <laughs> them do like a Parabella arc. So you start with original Gundam, where like they have a gun and they're mostly a robot. You get to Zeta, everything turns into a plane. You get to Double Zeta, mm -hmm. you get to, like, three robots combining into one robot. You get to Shara's Counterattack, and they scale it back a bit. Not everything transforms, but they all have little parts that fly off and shoot for you. But then you get to Gundam Wing, and they, like, designed it down a bit, where each one had, like, an obvious style choice. But mm -hmm. we get to Gundam Double O, and there's so many rights and lasers and transformations and flashing particle effects that people just kind of gave up, and it almost, like, soft reset itself. So when you get to Iron Blood Orphids, it's, I have a sledgehammer. Just a sledgehammer. That is my weapon on my robot. So uh, as a, two random side notes. The SD Gundam World uh, anime that I watched. Um, firstly, 
I realized that it wasn't the original BB Senshi uh, when one of the main characters introduced himself as Barbados. I was like, oh, so so this is this is relatively new. Okay, because Gundam Barbados is the main Gundam from Iron Blooded Orphans. Not to be and confused secondly, with Gundam Barbados Lupus Rex, because at some point they decide you need to upgrade your model kit. I mean, mech every midway through each season. And then the second thing is uh, Gundam Double O <sighs> in the SD Gundam Online was a uh, was an S rank uh, SD Gundam, uh, and he was also introduced as one of the main characters in the first episode, uh, <laughs> and then he died. In the first episode, Good. I was like, okay, what, where, where's the emotional payoff here? What's going on? <laughs> oh, I have such a deep personal hatred of Gundam 00 because they tricked me. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> then the show was 10 episodes long. And in the 10th episode, it turns out that the guy uh, that was piloting Gundam 00 had just like used his Gundam 00 powers to swap places with the bomb uh, and then just decided to peace out for like three months of in of in show time and just oh. wandered around getting stronger it's like what man <laughs> one of my favorite gundam series though was the first gundam build fighter before they jumped over the shark because like you know what we should do we took our anime we made a model kit we made a video game of the model kits so let's make an anime about the model kit video game so in true full circle it's like part of the episodes were physically how to make a model kit and then it was them coming to life and battling with their highest budget gundam animation <laughs> and I really enjoyed it, but then it kept getting increasingly ridiculous, where they're like the sequels. Now we have three-person teams, also they're alive? And I'm like, come on, guy. And they're like, now we're in a VR MMO with Gundams. I'm like, no. We just wanted to watch someone build a model kit, then fight with it. How did you overcomplicate this really dumb concept? It's like, I want to see first action. The season of Build Fighters was awesome. Right? Because they're like, yeah, we just build a Gundam and then fight them. It's great. And then they kept adding more and more supernatural elements to it for some reason. And mm. I'm like, if you're going to do that, why don't we just watch Gundam? <laughs> Stupid well, Gundam I mean, Double we, O and we its could aliens. Probably talk about... <laughs> we could probably rant about Gundam for for, for days. Uh, oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah I, I feel like this is probably a good natural stopping point for, uh, for us to say, hey, you know, post us some... Uh, some questions, because, you know, this is Deep Space and Dragons, so we need some dragon questions, and we need some random questions. You could win yourself a free ebook of the Waltz of Blades Deluxe. So for that, this week's dragon question comes from... I don't know what her web handle is, so I'm going to say the mysterious viewer, whom has already received their free copy, asks, would you rather have a Light Fury Dragon or a Night Fury Dragon? A Light Fury Dragon or a Night Fury Dragon? For clarification, a Night Fury is the Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon, and a Light Fury right. is the inverted color palette can go invisible female Toothless from How to Train Your Dragon. Right, right, right. From the from one of the sequels. Correct. It, from the second movie? or Third is, movie. Because there's like more than... Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, that depends whether or not you count Christmas specials. <laughs> I do not count Christmas specials or animated spin-off shows. Because I can. I mean, are we really going to bring back Christmas specials? Because then the Star Wars Christmas special happened. <laughs> Do you really want to open the door to that <laughs> timeline? There's a reason we have a time author a time variance authority is to prevent these kind of dangerous topics. Uh, but so I think um, I, I would rather have a Night Fury. Um, Night Fury, Toothless seems to be surprisingly not very nocturnal. Uh, being a big black dragon, if you're flying around in the sky, I think it'd be you know better to be seen during the day. So you're choosing the more visible dragon because you want to show off that you're riding on a dragon. Am I following that correctly? I mean that, yeah. And I mean, like, <laughs> if I'm going to use it as a means of transportation, you know, I want to be slightly safe. That is a fair point. As for me. Well, first I'm going to give the not really an answer that it turns out if you put a Night Fury and a Light Fury together, you get a little tuxedo pattern dragon. <laughs> which is okay. which is just superior, so I would go with the tuxedo dragon. Mm -hmm. But I'd also have to go for Night Fury. Just, well, yeah, I think I would have to because of my deep emotional connection with Toothless. 
as much as I enjoyed the third movie, the first one was... Actually, he had a really good development arc over that. We might tackle this movie on another episode, because there's some solid stuff there. There is some solid stuff there. All right, and now for our random question. Oh, this is a classic. And Carl, this goes into your, one of your specializations. Fruit on pizza other than tomatoes, yes or no? Fruit on pizza other than tomatoes. Um, well, I mean, like, this this depends on how loosely you define uh, pizza, because, I mean, like, people uh, like dessert pizzas. Um, you are and, not like, one of those people. Don't try and trick me here. <clears throat> I'm just saying, uh, caramel and banana on a dessert pizza sounds delicious. Um, Have we done that before? Like, I feel like we've done that before. Or like apple cinnamon uh, dessert pizzas, also pretty good. Uh, personally, um, I like pineapple on pizza. So, I mean, I know shots fired, but I, uh, I would definitely be willing to give fruit on pizza a try. So I heard a comment this weekend about the idea of putting pears on a pizza along with ham. And I am going to say uh, this. If we're going on mm -hmm. the put pineapple on pizza bridge, because me and you have both in our lives got severely discounted, if not free pizza. And when you have mm -hmm. a free food source, you have to remix it. So my friend, right. I'm going to stand on this hill and have the space colony fall on the both of us, because I am also pro pineapple on pizza. Because <laughs> I have tried probably a thousand pizza variations at this point in my life. And we've done the dessert pizzas. We've done the pizza burger. We've done the barbecue chicken. And I'm telling you, the buffalo chicken with banana peppers, pineapple, and feta cheese is good. Uh, or, like, um, a pizza with, like, apple slices. Well, okay, so syrup instead of pizza sauce. Apple slices... Uh, caramel and cheddar cheese or oh man that's actually sounds really good like the thing about pizza dough is it's surprisingly flavor neutral yeah it's very versatile like i've done the spicy pierogi pizza which is like the oh. sour cream el fredo the <laughs> thick cut potatoes the bacon the cheddar the italian sausage the green onions it was good uh, so yeah, that's a resounding yes. Fruit, fruit on pizza is definitely worth investigating. Yeah, and a declaration that we may be killed for this, but remember, as long as you don't yell, it's a Gundam, you won't die instantly. Thank you everybody for listening. And try <laughs> a new a pizza this week. week. Bye. Yeah, try, bye. <laughs>